Great. So uh, hello, everyone. So welcome to the ME Departmental Seminar Series. And today is our uh, very first seminar in this academic year. So it is our uh, great pleasure for having Professor Xinhan Zhang from Purdue University to present today. So I am Professor Ashley Busek and Professor, uh, Professor Jared Gordon, we are the co-host for Professor Zhang's virtual visit. So if you have any questions or need anything, please feel free to let us or let Karen uh, know. So let me uh, first briefly introduce our speaker. Professor Zhang obtained his PhD in 2001 from North Carolina State University. And then he received uh, the very prestigious director's postdoc fellowship at Los Alamos National Lab and worked there for two years. And he then joined the faculty of Texas and m University and moved to Purdue a few years ago in uh, 2016. Uh, Professor Jack is a very well-known expert working actively on many research fronts, including the uh, mechanical behavior of nanostructured material under extreme environment, the design of advanced materials for uh, nuclear energy system, and the additive uh, manufacturing of metals. And Professor John has received numerous recognitions along his career, including the NSF Career Award, the ASM Fellow, and the TMS Brian McCauby Award, and many others. And Professor John is also known for his uh, dedicated service to the community, so as currently the Nanomechanical Behavior of Materials Committee Chair at TMS, he has organized and overseen many important and well-attended symposia in the field. And he also serves as an associate editor of the prominent journal Science Advances. Um, today, Professor Zhang's seminar uh, title is uh, Design of Materials with Unique Mechanical Behaviors and Radiation Responses by Tethering Nanoscale uh, Defects. And since this is a virtual seminar, so to have the best experience, I suggest we do not interrupt Professor Zhang too uh, frequently while he is talking. So if you have any question, please either hold to the end where we will um, give some time for open discussions, or you can type into the chat box and uh, in the end, I will read it aloud to allow Professor Zhang to respond. Okay, so uh, with that, please join me uh, in welcoming Professor Zhang. And now let's give the time to him. Okay, so you can start. Great. So, so yeah, thank you so much uh, uh, for inviting us and inviting me to this uh, you know, great opportunity. And, and, you know, I have long been uh, hoping to visit uh, Michigan and I have many friends at Michigan. And although it's virtual, I get a lot of chance talking to uh, many friends, colleagues uh, today. So it's a great to get together, you know, uh, with a big group of, you know, students and faculties um, in this occasion. Uh, I basically, I will go through something, uh, you know, related to how do we design defects for the purpose of improved materials and mechanical behavior or radiation resistance. And, you know, this is acknowledgement list of the former students, uh, several of them now at national labs, uh, or at the university and collaborators, faculties from Nebraska Lincoln and, and Purdue and uh, Argonne National Labs. So collaborating on experiments and modeling. Um, so I think I I'm gonna to touch uh, upon three topics. One of these is uh, second thoughts, uh, how they introduce, how we introduce second thoughts, how can they you know, create high strengths, at least to high strengths in aluminum alloys. Um, and then the second topic is related to twin boundaries. Uh, how can we use twin boundaries to uh, tailor radiation uh, tolerance in metallic materials in general? And finally, I'm going to look at another type of materials, which is ceramics. Uh, ceramics can also have some stacking parts. And in some cases, stacking parts, if it's properly introduced, they can really help to accommodate plasticity. So, so in, the, in general, we're going to see uh, three topics that tie together by looking at uh, you know, very typical planar defects, either twin boundaries or stacking parts. So I begin by showing this. Um, on this, what you see here is uh, nanotube metal it has been studied for you know well over a decade, and it has been known in the community that nanotube metals can introduce high strengths 
So for example, if we look at this uh, chart, comparing the yield strength versus one over the square of T, which T is the thickness for copper and smaller clarity is stronger. And so nanotrains can introduce high strength. Um, and MD simulation has also shown this dislocation can be blocked by twin boundaries and transmit across twins in the form of loops and etc. And this is one of the in-situ video to show nanotin copper and their diamond dender tips. These twin boundaries can quickly evolve and emit a lot of partial dislocations. So going through the twinning and detwinning process. So, so this is all great, but you're going to find out a lot of this FCC uh, nanotin metal has been studied in the literature, primarily focused on low second fold energy metal, uh, something like silver, copper, very low or intermediate second fold energy. When it comes to aluminum, it's getting harder because aluminum is at close to the bottom of this table. The second fold energy of aluminum is, is pretty large, 160 and millijoule per meter square. So the question now is, if nanotwins really help introduce high strength and plasticity, can you use a similar concept, introduce second fold or twin bonds into aluminum? And then you go, if we look at you know, the answers to this question is being scattered in the, in the literature in the past uh, you know, decades, one or two decades, and you can introduce twins by deformation. So for example, uh, by using crowd milling, so which is a ball milling at liquid nitrogen temperature, you can introduce deformation twins. Uh, or if you perform nano indentation surrounding nano indent tips, you can see some you know, twin boundaries. This is just pure aluminum. So which is quite remarkable. And MD simulation shows, yes, high string rate deformation can also introduce twin boundaries in aluminum grains. Uh, and, and this is another example where we did some uh, projectile impact into the TM foil and you generate a hole using silica sphere. Uh, and then look at, you know, basically survey the green orientation evolution. And we find out this pretty large substantial uh, stacking box, uh, so-called IR phase in pure aluminum. So yes, you can introduce strings in aluminum, but you, you're gonna need either one of these three factors. So either high string rate, shock, low temperature, uh, crowd milling or nanograms or tiny grains. So, so this is not helpful to the sense if you want to introduce abundant twins and use twins to tailor strengths, you have to come up with something else. And so and hence we were asking ourselves a question, can we play with some tricks uh, to introduce twins in aluminum? And today we're going to mostly focus on using solids to introduce twins. Uh, and before that, if you look at the literature, history told us aluminum alloy has been well studied for centuries. And, and this is a classical age hardening mechanism, introduce precipitate, and, and then you can get high strength aluminum. Strength normally is like less than 700 MPa. Um, and if you introduce certain solutes like iron, and chances are you form by casting, chances are you form this giant intermetallic, uh, you know, precipitates, and, and that's really bad because this stuff is very brittle. Uh, and so this is why industry actually shied, shied away from adding a lot of iron. Most of the case you're adding less than 1%. If you add more, you run into the trouble of getting this giant metallic particles. So lead to embrittlement. So, so then for us, the question is, if we introduce iron through a technique other than conventional testing, for example, we uh, do this sputtering, what does it do to aluminum? Can we get twins in, in there? So this is the experiment where my student Chang Li did. Uh, if you simply sputter aluminum, you get this you know, single crystal-like aluminum with some green boundaries, domain boundaries. Um, and then if you look at actual core figure, it's just very classical single crystal-like pattern. Uh, so three-fold symmetry. But if you look at this, uh, 2% of iron doped in aluminum by sputtering. So green size reduced dramatically and cross section shows pretty fine columns uh, like bamboo structure. Um, and then cold figure shows you six fold symmetry. So instead of three fold and just pure matrix, now you have you know, three fold coming from twins and the other three spots coming from the matrix. So that confirms you do have the uh, you know, twin orientation in aluminum. So that, that is encouraging. And, 
when we look at this under higher resolution, I look for the defects. This is again cross sectional wheel um, in this aluminum. And, and you get you know green size. So the red dotted line shows the green boundaries. Green size is about 40 nanometer. And if you look at higher resolution, zoom me into some of these boundaries, and you find out uh, this huge amount of stacking faults and the pretty broad stacking fault. In many cases, the entire column can be filled with this kind of stacking faults. And, and this structure is normally called an IR uh, phase um, based on the high resolution TM. So what that means is, uh, in general, when we look at FCC uh, metal, the close pack uh, basically sequences ABC, ABC stacking. But when you introduce stacking faults in uh, aluminum iron case, your repeating unit is no longer ABC. It becomes nine repeating layers. So you give it a name called NIR, so nine repeating layer structure. So there is basically an instructed partial on every atomic planes, and, and but they're mixed, you have you know two screws, one edge, and, and their interaction is quite interesting. So I'll skip some of those detail, details, but in general, you're looking at a really high density of stacking faults uh, in this aluminum iron alloys. So this is with only 2% of iron. Uh, and, and then the question, of course, naturally is, if we're really getting the stacking box into uh, aluminum, or original planning was to look for mechanical behavior. Does that change mechanical strength of this aluminum? So and because the film is normally a pretty thin, like a couple of microns, 20 microns at most, um, you can make some pillars coming out of this and then perform compression test. Uh, so this is compression comparison between uh, alumina, pure alumina. And so this is diamond, diamond flat punch. And you see this very typical serrations because this is single crystal like alumina. So you have a lot of uh, low drops you know, due to the you know, initiation of dislocations on certain crystallographic planes. So it's pretty rough, noisy. And the flow stress is about 200, 150, 200, pretty soft. Uh, but you do the same kind of measurement for aluminum now doped with close to six atomic percent of iron using sputtering. Uh, and then you find out the flow stress here is a lot higher. So it is engineering stress from curve. Now it's already exceeding 1.5 GPA in, in this alloy. And the logic has the pillars and some classical you know, bulging on the top. Uh, so and there's no shear band, no fracture generally. So th th this is encouraging because we sort of see substantial uh, plasticity in this uh, aluminum iron. Now we call it now twin aluminum iron uh, films. Uh, and in this chart, we're basically compiling all this uh, aluminum iron together. So with different doping concentrations, 2%, 6%. Uh, and you find out, you know, comparing to pure aluminum, this is uh, much stronger. So you can get one GPA under compression or maybe sometimes 1.5 in GPA. So that's very high flow stress. It is already comparable to some of the high strengths in steel, uh, but of course in a thin film format. And on this chart, what Chang did was he summarized uh, specific yield strengths. And so this was defined as yield strengths normalized by the mass density. And XX is a specific modulus, so modulus Elastic modulus normalized by mass density. So there's a you know quite a bit of classical alloys, titanium, magnesium, steel, classical aluminum alloys, and a couple of data points and shows that his aluminum iron film with nano twins seems to be pretty strong. Um, and another question we need to address now we've measured experimentally this aluminum alloy is pretty strong. Uh, but the question is, how to explain this? So then we turn to a colleague, uh, Jian Wang, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. So we asked him, can you simulate this phenomenon? Um, so first experiment he did was to introduce stacking parts in aluminum. Uh, and it turns out to be unsuccessful because if you introduce stacking parts, in this case, stacking parts are highlighted in red atomic layers and the green is FCC matrix, uh, but this is aluminum iron. But if you introduce stacking balls in aluminum, and you probably can freeze them at very low temperature, zero K, and you heat it up to 300 K, they disappear. They will wipe out right away. They're unstable. But now the case for, for 
aluminum iron. If you introduce 5% of iron also, this structure it is stable. And so now you do this MD uh, construction. So you introduce all these 3D stacking faults in aluminum iron. Uh, and you can see this stacking faults evolve very quickly. So the orange color shows some unidentifiable crystal structure. Uh, so this, this is how the nanotrian aluminum iron should deform. And the 2D view shows a little bit better. Uh, in the sense, you can see something in a clear way. So again, green is the uh, aluminum iron uh, matrix, and the red is the nylon columns. So these are the columns filled with second bonds and nylon phases. And, and if you do this kind of compression test, and you find out these nylons actually they act as a walls to block dislocation penetration. So, so that gives us uh, you know, a couple of uh, yeah, impact. One of this is so they block this location transmission, they give you string hardening. So, this is the stress string curve for the line. So, you, you see a lot of very high strength and string hardening. And on the other hand, if these walls remain rigid and you can reach very high stress level, and eventually the whole thing might fracture. But that's not the case. Uh, what we saw was this narrow phase evolved. So this second narrow phase can be partially dismantled, but not completely. So they accommodate plasticity during high stress uh, deformation. So this shows narrow phase has probably played, they're playing two roles. And they're blocking dislocation transmission, but they also accommodate plasticity uh, to some extent. So we don't have to worry about the fracture. Uh, and, and then the next question we try to explore uh, fairly recently is to look at now you have introduced twins um, does nanotube metal has an isotropy meaning does elastic or mechanical behavior change when you test it in different direction uh, meaning in plane or out of plane direction so so then we this cartoon shows the test uh, we did so basically you can feed out uh, the pillars uh, and the tensile uh, dog bone specimen and this is relatively thick film and uh, they're about 20 micron. So, so now if you do this testing, you can do this test along the auto plane direction, auto plane tension or compression. You can also pull this in plane uh, within the thin film of planes to implant tension or implant compression. Uh, so then uh, that's the setup we did. And, and this is the tensile gripper uh, that we use for pulling the sample. Uh, and I'm gonna skip the compression test data because I showed some compression test data already, but mostly focus on the tension experiments. So here is one of the in-plane tension test. So this is that, you know, nanotune aluminum iron films. And if you pull on it, and you see this linear elastic behavior, boom, and the entire sample fracture. So it's pretty brittle. Uh, you reach a, about a, you know, stress level about close to one GPA, then you don't see much plasticity just very brittle behavior and you see some short leaps uh, surrounding the you know the gauge section but in general it's a brittle a fracture behavior uh, one of the things we're looking at now is we're giving this uh, nanotune aluminum iron pretty rigorous test because we're literally putting orthogonal to the column to the bamboo structures so these are very fine columns green size on the order of 10 nanometers and we're putting perpendicular to the green boundary. So uh, no wonder they're uh, brittle. Uh, and we don't see much dislocation events in this film. So the next experiment we did was to do out of plane tension. So same film, but putting out of plane direction instead of doing in plane tension. Uh, same setup. And what you see here is during, this is quite different compared to the other one, because what you saw here, there is a low drop but the whole sample didn't fail immediately. Instead, they failed one layer, and then the load can still come back up again, and then there's a gradual softening process. So this is better. It shows more plasticity compared to implant tension in the experiments, but you do see some substantial load drop through multiple tests, and, and then the load pick up again and soften it. And, and when you look at this fracture surface, you see it's close to 45 degree angle uh, you know, shear down. And, and from microscopy, we see quite a bit of intragranular fracture. Uh, 
and this is a shear surface, shear fracture surface. But when you do high resolution DM, you do see some kind of dislocation events at the beginning of this. All right, so uh, and then if you compare the world data to literature data, put this into perspective, and you find out, so this is a chart uh, where Chris, Chris Shu and uh, they did uh, years ago, where they looking at the uh, yield strength, sigma yc yield strength in compression, sigma yt is yield strength and the tension. Look at the ratio, which is green size, and you see this interesting trend. Uh, when green size is pretty large, more than about 100 nanometer, this ratio is close to one, meaning tension compression is symmetrical. And in many cases, this is the regime where uh, the material is very relatively ductile. So these are the data coming from nickel, copper, and aluminum. Uh, but if you reduce green size to tens of nanometer, and you start getting into partial dislocation dominated regime instead of full dislocation. And so now sigma yc is greater uh, and because under tension, there's a lot of premature uh, fracture, premature fracture. And so under tension, the, the yield strength is less compared to compression. And, and of course, if you keep reducing green size to 10 nanometer or less, then the whole thing reverse again. In this case, it's still relatively brittle behavior because getting green boundary dominated regime. Um, so if you look at the data we have for nano twin aluminum iron for the implant testing mode, it is large value indicating this is relatively brittle testing direction, but we do out of plane testing, uh, the ratio is getting back down to close to one, indicating now you start a C plus TC. So this is consistent with our, our experiment, uh, microscopy studies. All right, so that uh, is, you know, first topic I, I covered, I'm briefly talking about how can we uh, dope uh, aluminums to, uh, adding solutes so we can introduce nano twins. How can nano twins or stagnant parts improve the strength in aluminum iron alloy? Um, and then, if you know we have these IDBs and IRs, and they really block this location, introduce O-carding, and, and then there's all this orientation and isotropy gets into play. So now let me switch to the second uh, topic where we're looking at a different world, looking at pretty, you know. Uh, extreme radiation environments where the materials will be subjected to severe radiation damage. And, and now the question is, does stream boundary uh, respond well to radiation? And, and this is well known now to radiation community. Radiation introduced, neutron radiation induced voice welding. And so this is the part before and after radiation. So tremendous volume expansion. And, and mostly because we have introduced a large amount of voice and the tissue went away and voice left behind and give you so-called classical voice spreading phenomenon. So battling against voice spreading has been an you know, ongoing challenge for the community. And one of the things we will have to do is to reduce defect density you know, for materials under radiation. Uh, and, and these are a couple of things that's been offered out there in the community by introducing defect things. Um, you can introduce green boundaries, phase boundaries, twin boundaries, nano voice, free services. And this can also, all type of defects can help you to capture or absorb radiation use defects. And, and today I'm gonna to show some examples of two boundaries and a little bit of nano voice, a combination of the two. And so now we switch uh, from copper, sorry, from aluminum to copper. Uh, copper is an interesting FCC metal. It, it's a very uh, good model system. Uh, and we started by looking at, you know, nano twin 101 texture of copper. Uh, so this is a spotter copper uh, film. From plan view, you see single crystal like diffraction, but there's a bunch of nano voids in this copper. And so then you ask me, where are the nano twins? And uh, you don't see twins from top down view or plan view, you see them from cross section. So from cross section, you can see the twin boundaries, the twin boundary layers, and uh, average twin spacing is about uh, 15 nanometer, and the void diameter is about 10 nanometer. And these nano voids are mostly distributed along the uh, vertical twin boundaries, or green boundaries, if you will. Uh, and void size is very small, 10 nanometers. So now we have introduced some uh, nano twin and uh, nano void networks 
the question is how do they evolve? And, and you might think this is a bad idea because voice wedding has been proven and, and then most people would be concerned about, well, you have voice already. This is what will grow and make it worse. I have even larger voice after radiation. So here is the uh, in-situ radiation at Argon, uh, IVEM uh, using TM. We put in krypton ions uh, during radiation, and this is room temperature. And uh, those is low, 0.2 dBA, meaning displacement per atom. Um, and you see really complex contrast change and this voice interact really rapidly with a lot of black dots, which are radiation with defect clusters. Uh, and, and then my, so this was done by my one of former student, uh, Yuxing Chen. Uh, and, and later, my other uh, student who graduated recently, Chen Saigon, he did full of experiments. He basically drew me into the very beginning stage of early stage of this radiation. Contrast here is really complex. So he was looking at early stage radiation. Uh, and he put in all these colored lines to represent, you know, between the blue lines, these are the green boundaries. And you can see the nano voice right there located at the green boundaries. And the grains at the green interior. So he basically divided this region into um, blue, and blue, green, and the green three zones. And the area of each zone is about the same. So he can do statistics, look at the defect density of the unit area. Uh, one thing you notice which is quite um, bizarre is these defects near surrounding two boundaries. Uh, and we all know in the uh, you know, metallic material community, there's if green boundaries are good defect things. Then very often you have seen reported of uh, void denuded zone near the green boundaries or defect denuded zone. But we saw at least in the early stage of radiation, we saw defect populated zone right at the green boundaries in this case. So, so that is uh, nano white nano twin copper. Um, so now if we look at what happened to this nano voice, that, that is a big question to us because we all anticipate voice should grow. Uh, but if you look at this, just krypton radiation alone, uh, one emitting electron moles, one MeV. Uh, if you trace this to about 0.1 dBA for several voice, uh, one, two, three, and you find out all these voice reduce their diameter. Yeah. It's pretty much universal. Everybody is a shrink. Nobody grow in this case. And, and if you look at the statistics, the voice size versus the radiation time, and you find out, depend on the dose rate, if I have low dose rate, change very little. But when you accelerate dose rate, and the voice size decreases pretty rapidly. In some cases, it decreases drastically, decreases drastically. So we, we have seen in this case, uh, void shrinkage phenomenon. That was confirmed in this. Uh, nano white, nano tin copper. And of course, the question is this phenomenon is very counterintuitive. How do we explain this phenomenon? Why don't you see white sweating? You do see, how, how can you see white shrinkage? Uh, so, so then I'm going to show you this zoom in view of uh, in situ radiation uh, for nano white, nano tin copper. Notice in the red box, there's a black defect cling to the white voice. And it was being gradually sucked into the uh, dynamical voice right there, gradually sucked in there. So this is marine dimension of these black defects and it happens to be right next to the water. Uh, so that is an interesting phenomenon. And so we hypothesize that if this will be in the stitial loops and they fill in the voice, they might fill in the void. Uh, and this is MD simulation uh, performed by Jian Wang. Uh, where he put a nano voice, but his section is open. So you can see the inside of the voice. And he also put a, a front loop, which is in the stitch loop, right next to it, uh, hexagonal, hexagonal shape. Uh, and during radiation, what you find out is, and uh, this is copper cell phone radiation, all these in the stitch holes, many of them stream into the, uh, the voice as if this is a swimming pool. The, the stitch holes being ge disturbed, generated during radiation, they move into the voice. And when that happened, you basically naturally partially fill in the voice and partially destroy the loop. So consequently, what the nano voice is gonna do is to absorb radiation used in the stitchal loop, as well as introduce the voice shrinkage phenomenon. So, so this is what we uh, find from experiments and, and simulation. Um, and then you might say, what if you simplify the scenario? You remove twin boundaries. You look at 
and you know, just not a voice by itself, what's going to happen? So this is the example where we look at uh, copper, uh, not a one 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 and not a twin copper. Instead, is one one zero. So when you have one one zero single piece for copper uh, films, there there's no twin boundaries, but we still have this voice introduced uh, in the S topology film. And now if we perform the same radiation experiments, again, room temperature, and the video was accelerated 20 times. And look at the blue, yellow, and the red circle. And you find these voids actually, they all shrink as well at room temperature radiation experiment. Okay. So, so again, this is quite interesting because now there's no team boundaries. Let me show this one more time. So you see the, remember the initial voice size, and after you read it is to about 0.5 dBA, a matter of maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes also. And everybody reduced their size. And of course, all these black dots are radiation use in different clusters, um, either we can see uh, loops or in situ loops. But this void uh, shrinkage phenomenon was confirmed again without uh, two boundaries. So how do we explain this phenomenon now? Uh, so then we collaborate with uh, Antar, uh, Professor Antara was at Purdue. He's a phase field simulation expert. So he asked his student to set up two uh, model in pure copper. Uh, in one case, there's a relatively large void. Uh, and then another case, very tiny voids. A spec ratio is about the same. And the color code meaning uh, red, meaning it's vacancy concentration. And because this is a vacuum, so this is really dark red. And blue meaning this is we can see depletion depleted. And this void uh, is right in the center of the copper. So it is also colored in red. So this is a voice, this is a vacuum. And the blue here, this is uh, looking at, uh, you know, the interstitial rich environments. So during phase field simulation, uh, they consider surface energy, free surface evac, and introduce, you know, basically promote higher interstitial diffusivities, interstitial diffuse faster than we can see. And, and we were looking at voice size effect, um, voice shrinkage phenomena. And they also on purpose introduce a biased, uh, you know, point defects, meaning there's more in the schedule generated and then we can see. So now if you perform this uh, phase field simulation, so all these low dots are cascade induced, you know, you know we can see in the schedule rich environments. And you find out these voids, the larger voids gradually shrink, but the spec ratio, I mean the lens versus the width ratio, didn't change dramatically. But if you look at this same radiation on the small voids, this small voids quickly spiralized and then disappeared. And you show this, uh, this video is very fast, the small voids. But for the large voids, this is a very slow process. So this voids is still surviving after long times of radiation. But eventually, what you're gonna see here is this voids also spiralized. And after they spiralized, then it shrink uh, quickly. So what this shows us is basically uh, radiation-induced biased defect flux, meaning in the stitches, preferentially getting to the voice and leads to the feeding up of the uh, nano voice, uh, in this case for copper. Um, another thing I want to uh, touch upon, this is quite interesting. This is on radiation-induced twin boundary migration. So now we're looking at nano twin uh, metal, but it's silver another low stacking called energy metal. Um, what we're looking at here in the yellow box, this is a, a twin boundary, it used to be very sharp, but during radiation, this twin boundary really evolved quickly. So if I start from the beginning, uh, notice there's a very tiny step right here, but, but after, and this is the dimension of that step, and after radiation, uh, again, the krypton line beams, this step disappeared. So when you play that video, so notice this sharp corner, and this uh, orthogonal corner. And there is pretty rapid interaction in between process. And this corner now become blended, yeah, blended in the corner. So there's a lot of between events going on. Yeah, and the stream boundary keep evolving during radiation. So, so this rapid stream boundary migration event is interesting, but can be of a concern because if stream boundary evolve, if the tuning happens, then you don't have tunings, then what, what happens? And the metal become Classical metal again, metallic material again, we don't have a, a lot of these different things. Uh, so, to stabilize twin boundaries, then my, uh, one of my former students, Chun Zai, 
he designed an interesting experiment. He was comparing nanoking copper, uh, again, cross-section of nanoking copper, with copper doped um, previously with three atomic percent of iron. So now he added 3% of iron in copper and performed the same kind of radiation in parallel. Uh, and you notice the twin thickness is somewhat different. So these twins are somewhat finer in pure copper. They're maybe on the order of five nanometer or so. But on the other hand, nano twin copper iron, they indeed have a little bit larger twin thickness. And, and if you perform this radiation under krypton ion beams at 200 degrees Celsius, and you see some very interesting phenomena. Uh, first of all, all this defect changes, radiation based defect uh, loops. But if you notice what happened to twin boundary, there's pretty drastic twin boundary movement or between all these twins are getting shorter and shorter. And, and some of the col column boundaries now disappear. So this become a very large twins. And, but on the other hand, for this copper iron, we don't see much in between the events going on. So indicating this, idea maybe it is working. And that is somehow if you dope uh, copper with iron, you can stabilize this twin boundary. So, so here is a snapshot to show uh, nanotin copper after radiation for a while, three in DPA, uh, and, and twin boundary disappear. A lot of twin boundary disappear. So this is what you have before and after. But if you do the comparison for nanotin copper iron before and after five DPA, so this is a little bit higher dose than copper. And twin thickness evolution is quite different. For pure copper, uh, what you see here, this is um, basically twin thickness increase from five nanometer to about 29 or 30 nanometer. And there's a pointer. Sorry, I forgot about that. So this is five to 30 nanometer. And for copper iron, twin thickness used to be 15 and you end it up with somewhere around the same. So twin thickness didn't change much. So it meaning the twinning didn't really, uh, didn't really happen for a copper ion. Right, so, so this is what we said. This, so significant detwinning in nanotin copper, but very little detwinning in nanotin copper ion. Uh, so how do we explain the detwinning phenomena? This is detwinning in pure copper, nanotin copper. And this video plays repetitively a couple of times. So if you have a twin boundary, what happened is this twin boundary starts detuning from corner. And when detuning from corner occurs, they leave a very sharp twin tips in the center. And, and so this snapshot shows us the formation of the twin tips. And the tips become really unstable. Then there's a drastic collapse of the twin tips. So then it leads to this uh, detuning event. Uh, so now if you look at the same thing for uh, nanotin copper iron, uh, things are quite different. We find out these twin boundaries, they are not as, as sharp as uh, copper, uh, twin boundary in copper. This boundary is instead after radiation become a blur. So you have a darker band at the end of this twin boundary. So this is something we call, later you're gonna see this is IDD. Yeah. And not only there, they stabilize twin boundary, but they also capture some of these triangular defects. And these triangular defects are so-called stacking fault digital defects, SFTs. So they can be captured for being gradually absorbed by this uh, you know, a blur incoming twin boundary. So, so that is very different between you know, IDBs in copper versus in copper iron. So let me uh, move on and, and look at, try to explain how do, we, how do we explain this phenomenon? Uh, why would uh, iron help us to stabilize twin boundary? Uh, th so then Jen help us, Professor Jen will help us to do some uh, DFT calculation. In other words, you dope uh, aluminum, sorry, dope copper with impurity irons. And you can put irons onto interstitial position, substitutional position. And turns out the iron prefer to stay at substitutional position. And they also like to stay primarily at the incoherent twin boundaries. So this is IDD, this is CDD. So, so that is quite interesting calculation. So and energetic wise, you know, adding this impurities to the coherent twin boundary, adding iron to copper, you introduce, you increase that uh, unstable stacking fault energy. And the, the stable stacking fault energy has been increased slightly, but this hump has been increased. So, so this is one of the, uh, 
a good indicator tell us that in iron solids, they will increase slight, slight increase like about energies, but they basically will pin the ITVs. They prefer to stay at ITVs and make it hard for ITVs to move because in, in nanotech metals, the migration event is primarily driven by this ITV migration, ITV migration. All right, so, so this is a quick uh, summary on what we find out for uh, radiation damage in nanotech metal. Uh, we show if you have nano walls, nano twin networks, uh, this really help you to capture defects. And twin boundaries really capture defects and transport them to nano walls. Nano walls basically, they're like hotel rooms. They take the customers to situate the customer in the hotel room. So they absorb in the station rooms. Uh, and radiation indeed introduced twin boundary migration. And if this is a concern, there's a way to stabilize twin boundaries. So you can have this sustainable. Uh, defect networks continuously operate to, to reduce radiation damage. Um, finally, I want to use the last uh, 10 minutes also uh, to quickly talk about stacking bots, uh, how they play a role in terms of accommodating plasticity in ceramics. Um, so this is a very different topic now where we're looking at very classical ceramic like TL2. Uh, ceramics are known to be brittle in general, and they're hard to center. So recently there's quite a bit of study in the literature showing you can center ceramics uh, under electrical field. And the benefit of using electrical field is you can accelerate the sintering process. Instead of sintering ceramics overnight, five hours, a couple of hours, you can do this in a matter of minutes. Uh, it's very effective, very fast event. But because of this fast event, introduce some interesting phenomena in this ceramics. So in TL2, we find out this is EBSD shows green size in flash into TL2. And, and if you look at this titania and the TM, you find out all these stacking faults and as well as dislocations, which is kind of interesting because in ceramics, we're, and we're used to look at single crystal with very few defects, but after flash into we see many of these defects. So that is quite interesting as well as some and then avoids incomplete syndrome. Uh, so this is a sample of interest to us. Um, we decided to test their mechanical behavior. Uh, so to test the me mechanical behavior, we keep out pillars two to three micron diameter, the height is about five to six micron to so remain a one to two ratio, a spec ratio. And this in situ test tool allows us to go in SEM up to a few hundred degrees Celsius. In the current study, we basically tested it up to 600 degrees Celsius for TL2. Um, so here's an example where we were comparing uh, in situ compression of classical center TL2 versus uh, flash center TL2. So if you look at the classical conventional center TL2, it is really brittle. So this is low forces and the displacement. So that's it. So you get what you got. This is brittle phenomenon. We know this, it is brittle at room temperature, supposed to be. Uh, but when you test this uh, same condition for uh, TL2, basically uh, prepared by flash syndrome, you see some really gradual shift of the C bands, you know, in a layer by layer fashion, which is quite bizarre to us. So they indicate now in the um, ceramics, you know, at least at room temperature, we start to see a lot of plasticity uh, events, plasticity events. And of course, we perform this uh, testing, repetitive testing to see reproducibility. Um, and if we look at the snapshots, um, we see really drastic brittle fracture phenomena in conventional TL2. And of course, in flash cinder TL2, we see this gradual shift of the you know, pillar surfaces indicating there's a lot of you know, plasticity going on. And you know, even up to 8% of strain, we didn't see drastic failure. Uh, so the real question is, how do we explain this bizarre phenomenon? Um, and of course, if you flip out the pillar, uh, and look at the under TM, and we find out something quite interesting. This is the conventional titanium. Uh, you see, this is a brittle fracture uh, you know, uh, introduced during the compression test, we do see a little bit of twin boundaries, stacking parts here and there. Uh, but if you test 
do the same compression test. Look at the pillars for flash cylinder TL2. Remember this, you know, close to the top, we see this gradual slide, layer by layer sliding. Uh, and that turns out to be a lot of stacking faults, very high density of stacking faults, very high density of stacking faults. And the spacing is probably on the order of 10 nanometer or maybe even less. And we also see some uh, two boundaries in the decorated with stacking faults, but a lot of stacking faults. So this is quite interesting uh, to us, fascinating because now we can introduce plasticity again by using deformation used to stacking faults. Uh, what if we test this at high temperature? We'll quickly go through this. High temperature, 400 C. Again, conventional TL2 is brittle. And you can see these large separations uh, being generated. And then the heater top quickly slide out. Um, still brittle. Conventional is still brittle, even at 400 C. And for the flash under TL2, again, we see this you know, layer by layer sliding phenomenon. But we see this also large separations. Comparing to what we've seen in the uh, room temperature case, it's quite different. So then that indicate test temperature does change the formation mechanism. Uh, so this is 400 degrees C testing. And we also did 600 C mechanical testing. And then stress to curve reverted you know, from these large solutions to continuous stress to curve. Very different phenomenon. And microscopy really are the key to solve this problem. And so what it shows is, uh, at 400 degrees Celsius, we see this sliding, the layer by layer sliding. So instead of looking at plenty of stacking faults, many of those, there are two boundaries. There are two boundaries. And at 600 degrees Celsius, we found a lot of dislocations or, or dislocation tangles. So this is a classical dislocation event, but you activate it at higher temperature. So this is the difference in terms of testing temperature, how to change the formation mechanism in flashing to the tail. Uh, then there's another question we had to address. That is, why would you activate two mounted stacking faults? And so there was a DRT calculation performed by our colleagues at uh, NRL. They they find that, you know experimentally we find that there's near two mounted there's oxygen de deficiency. So there's oxygen vacancy near these two mounted. And by using their DRT calculation, uh, so this is image simulated. It's an IDPC image. Um, and, and they also did a TLT calculation that showed if you have oxygen vacancy, you can reduce the stacking for energy in TL2. So, so that allows us to explain uh, why it can trigger or introduce a lot of stacking points. Uh, but so in general, for this TL2, titania, at room temperature, plasticity is dominated by stacking points. We go a little bit higher temperature, tin bond will take over, and eventually it's dislocation. Uh, glide events. So, so that that is what I want to say that in the last topic and quickly summarize what I presented today. Uh, so we're looking at three topics, some more correlated, where you can use two boundaries for the benefit of introducing high strength plasticity, or improve radiation tolerance, or improve ductility even in ceramic materials. Uh, so, so that commonality really promote us to keep on looking at how can we tailor defects nanoscale defects to look at and you know, design some materials that is good radiation tolerance or, or plasticity for, you know, for various applications. So I think that's all I have. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Great, that's very good talk. That's uh, thank uh, Professor Jones, a very nice talk. So yes. now uh, we have uh, some time. So uh, if you have, want to uh, unmute yourself, ask any question, uh, please go ahead. Or if you want me to ask, you can type something in the chat box. I will read it aloud. So in the beginning, preferably any student have any question, like the students you're the priority. Okay, if a student does not have, uh, maybe I can uh, start first. Yes. So I think this is a really uh, great insight from three part of different uh, presentation, uh, different, uh, different part of project. 
So the, 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 the thing that really, uh, uh, I feel really curious is uh, you tried, say in the first one, in the alumni, you tried to dope some iron and also in the copper, you also tried to dope some iron and uh, greatly uh, facilitate the twinning formation. Uh, so why uh, iron? So I noticed that you, you, you collaborated or had some DFT calculations show that mm -hmm. it can, yes, indeed, uh, making the stacking for uh, energy higher, but uh, any uh, physical uh, insight, why iron? Could other elements be helpful in doing that? Yes, so that's a great, a great question. Uh, yeah. We, in fact, I showed you iron, but it has, we have, you know, been through a, a variety of exploration using different solids, uh, including chrome, moly, tungsten, some of the obvious we suspect. And, but in those cases, we don't see two models. Um, the things that work really well, they're iron, cobalt, nickel. And these are the three best solutes introduced to boundaries really well. Um, some other solutes like magnesium, titanium also works, but not as good as iron, cobalt, nickel. Um, so then we did a DFT calculation because uh, most of the time, our general impression is if you introduce twins in aluminum, uh, what you might have done is to reduce stacking part energy and so make it easier to, to twin. Uh, but what we find out, you know, in many cases, it's just the opposite. Adding iron could in, actually increase stacking part energy a little bit, increase the stable stacking part energy. But what else it does is to increase the unstable stacking part energy. So if you look at this energy landscape, right. if you increase unstable stacking part energy more than the stable stacking part energy, then the detuning barrier has been increased. Uh, so what I mean is during sputtering, if you can introduce stacking parts and the energy barrier has been, energy barrier for detuning has been increased, then you can stabilize this now Yeah. Right. Yeah, so this is a, uh, uh, really, I think this gave us a general rule how, how you select uh, uh, ways. Uh, so That's right. to this is one this of energy the, landscape, yeah. Yes, this is one of the puzzle. yeah. Right. So uh, another thing, so you, when you, in the first part, you show the MD simulation. So because you mentioned for the pure uh, alumni, the, the many 20 are, are quite uh, unstable, right? You, you do the simulation, they, they disappear somehow. But if you, uh, uh, maybe I, I missed the details, but mm -hmm. I, I believe it's uh, on slides 11, uh -huh. if you don't mind to share that sure. today. Yeah. Let me share the slides. slides 11. This one? Yes, 11, exactly, yes. So so I, I wonder, because I myself is doing modeling, I wonder how exactly they're setting this modeling. So in this modeling, they, they have some iron solute uh, placed into the twin boundary to stabilize the thing. Uh, in this case, I think, I believe the iron is all over the map. Iron is everywhere. Okay. And uh -huh. then, but they introduced stacking boss probably by sheer. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. an MD uh, person, so, uh, but, you know, I believe that's this is what Jen told me. They introduced stacking parts by sharing the crystal, so mm -hmm. that allows us to stabilize these stacking parts. Yeah. Right, but with <laughs> iron randomly, say a place uh, here and there, uh, this mm -hmm. uh, twin are able to be uh, stabilized compared with the, the pure uh, aluminum system. Yes, if you have a pure aluminum, then mm -hmm. the stacking parts are not stable. The stacking parts sure. you wipe out right away. Mm -hmm. uh, but right. if you have uh, iron dopant, once you introduce stacking parts into the columns, they stay, they don't, they don't disappear and unless you apply mm -hmm. very high stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, so that, that. that's, they probably, there is some MD simulation uh, mm -hmm. recipe they used. So I, I, I don't know how they exactly did that. <laughs> yeah, but this makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, in a uh, different uh, uh, area like Chris Shu or uh, Tim Rupert, they, mm -hmm. when they want to stabilize their nanocrystal materials, yeah, they, they put some minor uh, doping right to the green boundary to stabilize right. whole thing. I, I think yeah, the, 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 they share the similar spirit. Yeah. So yeah. just just good to see that. And, and another thing, actually, your second uh -huh. part is really fascinating because uh, the void shrinkage on irradiation. Uh -huh. Because uh, I I recall that when I was a student, what way when we learned this avoid sweating, uh -huh. the the narrative there was uh, the logic is. Um, uh, uh, how to say that the logic is something like, yeah, you have, you have the bias, uh, this location okay. bias or green boundary bias. Then when you eradicate interstitial and vacancy, interstitial is more easily being absorbed by those things. 
So left behind is vacancy. So vacancy is somehow at longer time they can accumulate and That's grow. Right. Yeah. So, but now you show convincingly uh, from experiment that, yeah, uh, uh, it's not the case. Uh, there's a new mechanism and it's clearly showing that the, the interstitial loop, right? So it's yeah. uh, right. combined with a uh, uh, with, uh, uh, void. Yeah. How, that, that, that interstitial loop, so how that uh, was created by irradiation or by deformation? Uh, yes, so these loops, these are loops are mostly created by radiation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay. so if we, if we look at this uh, video, uh, a lot of black dots, these location mm -hmm. loops, they're generated during cascade. Because during uh -huh. cascade, uh, we introduce uh, vacancy class, vacancy flux, and initial flux. Sure. And in the initial move very quickly, they move away, like exactly what you said, vacancy left behind. So you normally have vacancy core. The initial wave goes away at first. Mm -hmm. So, so you, in this case, you have vacancy in the cluster as well as in the initial cluster. Um, but something else happened in this case is during radiation, we when we generate uh, a vacancy flux, a lot of vacancy flux from SFT. So SFT give you mm -hmm. the biased, and they form a sort of like a biased uh, uh, vacancy uh, sink. So they capture vacancy. But in the schedules, we'll find all these neighbor voice. In the schedules, uh, without the voice, they will just go to free service. They go everywhere. But now mm -hmm. we introduce this nano voice in a neighboring place within the grains. In the schedule, we just, yeah, I don't have to go too far away. And they find the voice, and they fill it in uh, right away. Mm -hmm. So instead of having this sweating, then you fill in the voice that has been generated on purposely inside mm -hmm. the material. Okay. So this yeah. is, uh, I've been asked this kind of question that is, you know, what if voice are gone? You don't have this voice anymore. Then we don't have the voice. Then it loses the purpose of capturing all this in the schedule. So, mm -hmm. if you properly introduce voice size distribution, there's a hope you can sustain this radiation sinks for a long time during radiation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because uh, what's occurring in my mind is that sure, under irradiation, you generated some interstitial loop. And meanwhile, uh, due to the reason that you have to have a conserved number of atoms, meanwhile, you have to create some vacancy, maybe small uh, vacancy somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. So now when this mobile interstitial loop, they recombine, uh, eat up with some existing larger void. But mm -hmm. I mean, the newly irradiated small void, they, I mean, at a different time scale, maybe they, they, they could also potentially accumulate up. But meanwhile, maybe you reach a dynamic balance. So overall, you still have a smaller, uh, but never disappear uh, vacancy uh, or void distribution. I, I, is that so? Yeah, I think, you know, if you keep on reading this for, you know, for a long period of time, you know, you can still generate some voice introduced by radiation, radiation induced voice, mm -hmm. like SFTs can grow. Um, mm -hmm. But the pre-existing voice, they basically capture the audience interstitial. So this is part of the things, the voice spreading is not really introduced by voice, it's mostly interstitial went away. Um, mm -hmm. But if you capture this interstitial, then you don't lose them, then you don't have this volume, outward expansion and volume, so-called voice spreading. Um, mm -hmm. So in this case, we're introducing this voice to let them sit in at the home for interstitial. Uh, exactly mm -hmm. how does that evolve? The voice are filled in, then maybe we lose this uh, good defect sinks. Then you have relation dues, SFT grow to become voice again. And, mm -hmm. and then you revert it back to the old cycle. So, right. So if you can stabilize this voice to some extent, so that might be a beneficial thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's, it's great. Yeah, really, uh, every uh, part of your presentation really uh, brings some new insight, I believe. So uh, I might have asked too much question, but but I still I really I, I do have another question I really want to ask. This is uh, uh, related to slides twenty six. Mm -hmm. uh, you show this twin boundary motion. I think yeah, that yeah. is also uh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So this experiment, uh, are there any global uh, stress applied? That's a good question. Uh, normally. When twin boundary migrate, you would consider mm -hmm. there's a stress, uh, but in this case, there's no external stress. Uh, I but, see. The, but there's still stress uh, near the twin boundary because when interstitial loops, or when vacancy loops interact with the uh, uh, twin boundaries, it generate all these dislocation loops generate their own stress field. So mm -hmm. it does trigger a migration of uh, you know shock partials. So locally, there is a, sort of like a, a localized stress field trigger mm -hmm. the twin boundary migration. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, and some of the things I showed, in, for example, in this video, uh, uh, I guess I cannot play this video unless I go full slide show mode. But this leads to this rapid detuning process. Uh, so if you have dislocations, loops, if they're so small, you don't see, they lead to this rapid detuning from the corners, at least to a large, really fine tunes. And, and this is giving you enough driving force. And because driving force for detuning is really inversely proportional to the twin thickness, the smaller the twins, and the finer the twins, the higher the detuning force. And so this actually is another, so energetically speaking, uh, there is, consider there is a, a, you know, energy minimization uh, as a driving force leads to detuning mm -hmm. the event. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is really uh, thought provoking. I think there's uh, many potential ways. Yeah, we can do some modeling to 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 test yeah. how the, the 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 coupling between some intrinsic or an external stress how they couple with this. Emotion. Yes, in fact, this is a field actually quite interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. We have shown this experimentally, um, mm -hmm. but I think there has not been much modeling work uh, to try to explain the detailed phenomenon. You do see these sharp tips generated, but there's yeah. a lot of modeling work to be done, in fact, yeah. Right. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, it's really, really a fantastic uh, yeah. work. Thank you for sharing with us. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I know Professor John has another uh, individual meeting just a few minutes away, but uh, any uh, other question, please unmute yourself to, to have discussed. All right. So if there is currently no, uh, maybe we give uh, Professor Ajahn another round of applause and uh, yeah. in a few minutes to rest and to continue his other individual meeting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much you. Uh, for, yeah. for uh, giving us this fantastic uh, seminar. Yeah, my pleasure.